Okay, well, thank you for being here today. I know there's several other good talks going on right now that you could be here, so I appreciate you uh, making time in your schedule to come to, to this talk. Um, first, if I start wandering, I, I do not like podiums at all. Um, so I may come down, but my voice tends to carry fairly well, so I think it'll be fine um, if that does happen. Today I'll be talking to you about um, the multilateral development of youth athletes and how we can go about training youth so that they are more well-rounded. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about injury prevention, some of the things you see. Uh, we'll talk about some of the stats out there looking at specialization that we see a lot now. I know there was a talk earlier this morning um, that dealt with specialization of athletes. And so we'll look at that, and then we'll look at some things um, that I've done with some youth athletes, um, whether it be soccer, basketball, um, different areas, uh, to help train them that aren't necessarily sport-specific but are designed to help them become more well-rounded um, in whatever they may choose to do. So first, let me give us a little bit of thanks here at NSCA uh, for bringing me in here and allowing me to do this today, and also to UMHB. Um, I've been there I'm going into my seventh year now. Uh, my past history, I was a high school science teacher and coach and education specialist um, in Texas, and so that gave me a little bit of background in dealing with different ages of athletes, hearing the, the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas telling me that their kids were the world champions, um, and they were just in the county. They never left, but yet they were still the world champions. Um, and so dealing with that and see how they came up and, and working with them as high school athletes along the way. So as far as objectives today, um, looking at the implications of early sports specialization, we see that a lot now. Um, and let me preface with all that with, I fully understand that there are some athletes out there just blessed with an unbelievable amount of talent, that they're the ones that are going to be, you know, from the get-go, from the time they're born until the time they're, they're drafted, picked, or whatever, they're just blessed with that ability. Um, reading some information last night, folks like your Bryce Harpers, you know, that were invited to play on different travel teams at 10, 11, 12 years of age, you know, and flown all over the country. I understand those are there. The vast majority of our athletes are not those, okay? And so that's what I want to preface that with is I fully understand that you may deal with some that, you know what, we see it, we see it right now, um, but we'll look in some stats and see that um, that's not necessarily the case with all of them. Look at injuries um, with early sports specialization. Also look at um, what the research that's out there. Uh, when you start looking at or trying to find research that deals specifically with youth, there's a ton of information on specialization. When you start looking at it, what's out there about, you know, overall generalized, the, the big picture of multi-sport athlete, there's not quite as much. So we'll talk a little bit about um, that. And lastly, look at some new training methods. Um, some of you may be doing some of these things already. That's fine. Um, but hopefully what we talk about, you can apply and take it back home with you. And I'm big on that um, with my students that I teach is that I want every one of them to leave, whether it's my class or, or something that we do, with the ability to apply it out there in the real world. I tell them all the time, we can teach you a ton of book knowledge, but unless you can take that out there and use it with your athletes and have to tweak things, then it, it may not, it's not that good. Okay, so book knowledge is great, but application is even better. So with this, looking at this slide right here, how many of you have been around athletes that say, Coach, I just don't want to do this anymore? Y'all ever had that happen to you? Let me see a show of hands. Anybody ever had that happen? Let me tell you a little story about it. I was, my kids are, I've got a son who's fixing to go off to college, and I've got a 16-year-old daughter. Um, I coached both of their little league teams, baseball and softball, at 10, 11, 12 years of age. Had an outstanding left-handed pitcher. Um, and we had, he was 11 years old. Just having one of those off games, I walk out to the mound to talk to him, and I say, hey, man, what's going on? He looked at me, he said, that right there. He said, Coach, I just don't want to do this anymore. So this is the middle of a game. I think, okay, I've got a dilemma. And I said, all right, I understand that, but right now I need you to play first base for me, and we can talk about this later. All right, so sometimes your athletes might say that. How about the next one? Coach, the only reason I'm doing this is because my mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, somebody else wants me to do this. All right, and see, show hands on that one. Ever heard that? Okay, the athlete's really not into it. They just feel obliged to do it for one reason or the other. So why are they saying this? You know, why do they say these two things and many others that I'm sure you've encountered? Um, and then the other one is why is it that some of them who are outstanding athletes, like that kid, just for whatever reason, lose that drive? Okay, and we'll talk a little about burnout and some things like that as we go along today as well. Um, by the way, that kid, after I told, when I talked to him after the game, I said, what do you really want to be doing? And he said, I really want to skateboard. I said, okay, then go be a great skateboarder. And he said, but my dad won't let me. Um, and come to find out that kid was playing on not only on a little league team, but he's playing on a couple of other select teams as well. Um, so the kid was just, he didn't know a life outside of playing baseball, right? Which I love baseball, that's fine. 
But this kid was getting to the point where he didn't want to do it anymore. So looking at this, talk about what is exactly multilateral development. Um, if you break it down, you look at the beginning of it, that multi means many, right? Um, and then the lateral means, you know, the movement, be able to do that and move in different planes um, and allow the athlete to be good at many things and to help develop them over time. Uh, how many of you ever athletes that come in and they are fully developed from the get-go? Age five, six, seven. Some of you have, yeah, those, those are those blessed ones that they're there. Most of them, you get there and they're five, six, seven, eight, nine years old, and you throw a ball at them, and the younger they are, they don't even know what to do. You might hit them in the face. Um, you ask them to do a squat for you, and they ballistically go down and come back up, and they're fine, but they don't know how to do things correctly. So looking at it from that standpoint. So simply put, it's overall physical development, okay? Developing them from head to toe, the athlete that has the ability to change direction, do things correctly to help prolong their athletic career should they choose to do so. Provides a foundation for later development, right? I mean, many athletes out there are, are really good at the, at the beginning, but they haven't developed this, this foundation to let them be good as they, as they progress in their athletic careers. So they, they're there and they might be the outstanding 12 year old Little League World Series pitcher, but a few years later, you never see them again because they were great at that time, but that, the, the foundation they needed to continue that wasn't, isn't there anymore, and so everybody else catches up with them. It allows them to, to develop physiological and the psychological foundation. How many of you would say that eight, nine, 10 year old athletes are psychologically developed enough to handle the stresses of all the sports they might participate in? I mean, they just wanna have fun, right? You put them in a stressful situation. Most little kids in sports, when you put them in stressful situations, They'll either say, oh, well, or they'll do this buckle and that they can't handle it. So developing some of that. So why multilateral development? Looking at this annually, there's about 3.5 million children that suffer, under 14, that, that um, suffer injuries in team or individual sports. So quite a few out there that, that get hurt, whether it be as a result of playing or a result of an overuse type injury. We see those kind of numbers. Half are a result of overuse. So if you look at that, about 1.75 million injuries are directly related to that athlete being repetitive motion. Not necessarily routing the base, getting hit. Um, and my son blew his ACL out as a seventh grader getting hit. It was an overuse thing. He just got hit wrong in a practice. Um, and so that's not what we're talking. We're talking about these athletes that get hurt because they're doing repetitive things. And if we look at it nowadays, it's 12 months out of the year. And some of them, if they could do even more than that, they never stop. You know, if this was a 15-month year, that's what they would do. Let me give a little, not a, necessarily a promo to this book, but this is a book I use in one of my classes. Um, it's called Any Given Monday, and it's written by um, the renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Andrews. Um, outstanding book, very easy read. Um, it goes through many different sports and talks about the types of injuries that we see in those sports and the things that practitioners can do to help their athletes not suffer those injuries. And if they do, then what? Right? What can you do with them? Um, very interesting, in this book, he was one of the first that if you look at Little League rules, he's one of the first that started promoting the idea of pitch counts um, over games. Um, he said he had really no idea what number he was looking for. He just knew something had to be done in order to protect these young athletes from injury. So he threw the numbers out there. I believe it's 20, 40, 60, and 85, I believe is the numbers. Um, days off, he was looking for a certain number. They said, no, we want three days. And he said, okay, that's fine. So he got what he wanted. He just wanted something. Um, so this book does an outstanding job of going through lots of sports. And what I like about it, you know, when we deal with, with our students that come mainly from Texas, is that we're dealing with athletes that are football, baseball, softball, basketball, pretty much, maybe some soccer athletes. Um, what we don't deal with a lot are lacrosse, hockey, things like that. So this book talks about those injuries because I tell my students, you never know, you may get offered a job somewhere and they may ask you to coach one of those things. And so now you have at least some idea what's going on there. So outstanding book if you wanna to use that. So here looking at this multilateral development coming from Bumpa and Hoff, um, a little progression here. If we look at childhood, um, how many of y'all when you were younger um, ran, were outside doing things? I know some of y'all in here are, are young enough to where you weren't allowed out on the streets, but I know I grew up out in West Texas. Okay, and we rode through the oil fields. Um, you know, if it, we carried our BB guns around town without the threat of getting arrested or anything. If it, if it flew, it was dead, or if it moved, it got shot. That's kind of how we, we shot the oil rigs. 
Um, kids nowadays don't do the things we did. They don't run around. If they climb trees, somebody's getting called to come get them down. It's probably the fire department. The parents are going to be in trouble. So they don't do the types of things that we do now. So in childhood, what we want to focus on is having those kids do as many things as we possibly can while at the same time allowing them to have fun with it. Because there's a lot of kids out there that do it, but they don't have fun with it. As they progress, okay, to when they become junior athletes, then we can start thinking about specializing them. For instance, right now I'm working with a girl um, who just won the, the South Texas Regional Javelin Championship. Um, in Texas, our high schools do not throw the javelin. So I was a decathlete at Baylor, so they were trying to find somebody who could help this little girl with the javelin. Never thrown it before, she did have taflon and she had to learn how to do it. Um, she's also a gymnast, okay? And, in, and for her, her gymnastic practice, I asked her the other day before I came out here, I asked her, how many days a week do you do gymnastics? And she said, every day. I said, how long? And this was at our practice I was having with her at 5.30. She said, well, I got there at 8 this morning, and I finished at 3, and we had an hour break. So if you start doing some math, that was six hours a day this girl was going, um, on top of an hour with me doing the javelin, and then another hour plus that she was going to spend working on some other things out there. So her day, five days a week, is basically running from 8 in the morning till almost 8 at night, with about three-quarters of that time, or a little bit less than that, being on gymnastics alone, and now she's crossing over. So she's starting to specialize a little bit more on the track and field side of things, um, and not necessarily as much gymnastics. She said she wants it to back off. Problem is, mom and dad own the gym that she's at, and so there's the mom-dad thing again. Um, and then after that, once we get up to maturation, now we can start looking at high performance. So we want these athletes to progress and move up the spectrum from let's get them developed in a wide range of motions, in a wide range of sports, then start to let them specialize, and then let them move up um, into their peak performances. The literature out there has a lot on there are certain sports that, yes, you do have to specialize very early. Diving, gymnastics, some of those, um, figure skating was another one that says, you know, we need, to, we need to progress them and get them up to the high levels pretty quick. Most sports do not, though. So what exactly is the specialization? When we look at it, it's, Hill says it's an athlete participation in a single sport which is trained and competed in on a year-round basis. How many of y'all deal with athletes that are in one sport 12 months out of the year? Okay. Nine months out of the year. So some of you get that little the three-month break that a lot of literature suggests. So that is specializing. When you've got athletes that are only in one sport for that amount of time, they're specialized. Group says deliberate advancement of systemic training or systematic training and plan competition with a specific goal of guiding the child on a long-term basis to achieve in the sport. So now we start to get into the multilateral side of things, to letting them develop over time. So they specialize either early on or later on down the road as they progress in their athletic development. So here's something I'd like for us to do. The, the guidebook poll that the NSC had set up, um, we got an email that was not functional. Um, so I've set up another one that I'd like you to try, and it's, it's free, so we may not get everybody to actually do this. But if you have your cell phones with you, provided everything flies nice for me, I'd like you to do this. So get, get out your phones for me. And what you do is if you text Brian Brabham 101 to 37607, that kind of gets you into the system. And then you can answer the question of um, at what age do you believe athletes should begin to specialize? And that'll kind of give us an idea of, you know, just a little discussion here. So hopefully we can get out of all the metal in this room and actually get a signal through. And I'm not responsible if you're not unlimited texting for the charge. Maybe yes, maybe no. I'm going to give this about 20 seconds, and if it doesn't start to play nice, we're going to go back. Okay, that's it. That's about all the time I'm going to give it. Works great in class. Not playing so nice right now. So that, let me see. So how many of y'all would say, just give a range here, five to seven years old? Do you believe at that point they should specialize? 
I got a 7 to 9. Okay, got 1. 9 to 11, 12. Okay, now we start to get a few more hands. How about 12 to 15? Okay, 15 to 18. All right, now more hands go up. And then how about 18 plus? So I'm still going up, right? So we have the range in here. We have everybody in here. So we could have some real lively debate discussion of that. Uh, but for the sake of time and health, we won't do that. So roughly, and the literature's scattered um, about when they should start. So here's some of the problems we face. Parental pressure to succeed, right? I mean, how many, most of the parents that I've dealt with, they have good intentions for their kids. They just don't know how to handle those good intentions. They'll pay thousands and thousands of dollars for their child to be coached, trained, different things, but they don't realize what it's actually doing to them. So that's putting pressure on the kid to actually be successful when the kid may not really want to be there. How about this one? How about a desire for scholarships? How many of your athletes, the young athletes, are doing it because they feel they're going to get a scholarship? Most of them, most of the young ones. Um, played golf, my son and I did with a kid the other day who was another outstanding pitcher. Um, about two years ago, three years ago, uh, he tore his rotator cuff, was set to have a, a baseball scholarship to Texas A&M um, to pitch for them. Done. He said he can't throw anymore, so he took up golf. So his scholarship was, has run. He's still going to go to A&M, but the, the ability to play baseball for him um, was done. And this was a kid who played probably 11 and a half months out of the year. Um, he was on a couple of select teams, playing on a little league team as well. Um, but he was out there, and his dad, I remember at that age, 11, 12 years old, that's what he was talking about about we're doing this so he can get the scholarship, which good intention, but the long-term ramifications actually cost his kid. And that's not everybody. I just fully understand that. That not all of them are going to suffer a scholarship-ending injury, uh, but some of them do. Look at this. 0.1% of the kids in sports will receive a scholarship. So out of all of them out there, a very minute amount are actually going to get a scholarship to participate in sports after high school. How about this one? Dr. Andrews is in, in his book, the odds of making an NFL roster are 6,000 to 1. So those, those people out there that are, you know, I'm going I'm to make it into the league, I'm going to make the NFL, chances are it's probably not going to happen. I, and I tell mine when I coach, I said, I hope they do. I hope you're one of those. But the realistic odds are you're probably not going to be. Um, and if you've watched ESPN, they've got shows on all the time that talk about, you know, making it onto a team and getting the phone call that says or not. Then they talk about, okay, now what? Um, and so my stress when I coached was always on the kids and have, making sure they had that backup plan. Um, and I told their parents, I hope your child is your retirement plan. I really do. But we need to talk realistic here, okay? Here's some other stats real quick. According to the NCAA, in baseball, there's almost 500,000 high school players. 6.9% will make it to the college level. 86 of those will make it to the major leagues. Football, there's over a million high school players in the nation. 6.5% of those are going to play in college. 1.6% of those college athletes are going to make the NFL. So the numbers go way down. Men's basketball, okay, over half a million. 3.4% of those are going to play in college. 1.2% of those 3.4% will make it to the NBA. Okay, and then men's soccer is another one, there, and the stats go on and on and on, and you take a look at it. Um, there's about 400, almost 420,000 high school players. 5.7% of them will play in college, and 1.4% of those will be drafted by the MLS. So the reality is, out there in these millions of kids that are playing sports out there, how many of them are going to make it to the major leagues, to the professional level? It's a very small amount, okay? And folks don't understand that. Our kids go into it. I remember when I was a kid, what are you going to do? I'm play professional baseball. Didn't happen, okay? And so we have to look at that. But some things we have to consider. We have to distinguish the demands of the program. How much time and energy does it require? Um, that little girl that I'm working with, I work on her with the javelin for one hour a, uh, a day, one day a week. That's it. Okay, plus she's got all these other things going on. Could we go more? Sure. Um, but we have to look at the time and demands. Gymnastics is another thing. You know, she's doing six plus hours a day of gymnastics. Yes, that's another thing. Multi-events that she's doing within that particular sport. Um, and so lots of different things there. Intensity of the training. How hard is it for that athlete to train? Uh, are they real young and they're being pushed to be a distance runner and they're out there running for hours? Uh, are they in the gym for several hours a day? Um, and we have to look, be careful of there, are burnout and injuries. You know, if I get an athlete who, once again, going back to this, the repeated in use thing, if they're doing this over and over and over, six, seven hours a day with not a whole lot of break in there, 
Now we could have some joint injuries about to happen. Or they're starting to burn out from it. They don't like it anymore. They don't want to do it. Um, and so that, that could end their career early. Some considerations. You, you've all heard, if you've read the books, the Essentials book, there's Essential. I mean, there's Chronological Age and Training Age. You know, how many of you have seen the kids, you know, Little League World Series and all that, that has a 12-year-olds at 6'5", that, you know, by the book they're 12. By body type, they look like they're 21. Um, and then you've got the other one who steps up and they're four foot six. Um, and so differences there in, you know, their age, their biological, where they are, how long they've been training. Um, I've dealt with several athletes that the first time I put them through a workout as a, as a younger athlete, I say, how much have you done? That was the very first day they'd ever done anything as far as any kind of structured training. Okay, so nothing in the past, just running around playing, um, which is what I try to mimic with the workouts. As far as early specialization goes, what well, we know, injuries are increasing. We see it out there. Dr. Andrews talks in his book um, that on a single day he did eight Tommy John surgeries, two of them on college players, two of them on, on uh, professional players, four of them on high school athletes. So eight Tommy Johns in one day with half of them being high school athletes um, that he's seeing that in. Um, I did an internship in physical therapy, and I, we saw several um, that were 14, 15 years old um, that had Tommy John surgery. One of my daughter's good friends blew hers out in playing softball. Um, and so we, we see that increasing. Kids used to participate in a variety of sports. They went from football to basketball to baseball track. You know, so my brother-in-law, I think he did five, but his main priority there was because it got him out of school more days of the week. Um, but he did several things, and many of us did. I was a, a, a football, baseball, basketball, and I usually found out by halftime, track guy. Um, that was my thing. We didn't do just one thing. Now, when you go to schools and start talking to athletes, what do you do? Well, I play you know, football and I play baseball, but next year I'm not going to play football because I'm going to focus on getting the scholarship as a senior. And so we start to see that happening as well. So they're not doing as much as they were before. Um, as far as health benefits go of this multilateral development, we can get some different development, different muscle groups. So instead of repeated use of the arm, throwing, throwing, throwing all the time, now we get them out of that for a few months, do some other things that will help them to progress. When they come back to baseball, they're better off. Um, my son was a, a baseball pitcher and a quarterback for a while. Um, during his, one of his physicals, the doctor did the normal range of motion thing. He could go back fine, but when he came forward, he could get to about right here because he had some muscle imbalances going on because of throwing so much. Um, motor skills develop. The multi-sport athletes um, used to be the norm, no longer, as I've already mentioned. There's that pressure again to succeed. Their parental pressure, and I want to address this one, those high fees to play on some of these select teams. Um, I mentioned it earlier, you, you're talking two, three, four thousand dollars um, $4,000. Both of my kids played on for just a couple of years because then it got to be where was, we were traveling a lot and it was just like, we, just, we can't keep doing this. Um, and plus, my son and daughter both told me they felt that pressure a little bit because they knew we were paying and they didn't want, to, they didn't want that pressure anymore. So I was more than happy to pocket that money back again um, to get them out of there and let them be kids again, even though the, the people they worked with were pretty good. Um, the other one, and I faced this one when I was coaching, is we had multiple athletes on, on, or athletes on multiple teams. So I had little league pitchers that I had no idea until I found out through the grapevine that they were playing on two other select teams as well. And so by the time they got to me, you know, I'm thinking about the whole pitch count thing that I have to worry about, not realizing that this kid might play in four or five games on the weekend as well. And where they had, they had an inning rule, but they had no pitch count rule. And so I had to start keeping that in mind. So, okay, this kid's, you know, thrown who knows how many hundreds of pitches over the weekend, but now we've got him out here, and I've got to try to figure out what to do with him to protect this kid. Um, because I wanted, yes, it was fun, we wanted to win, but I wasn't going to ruin a kid um, because they were doing some other things. So there are multiple, multiple sports. So some questions for thought here are a question. How many sports do your athletes participate in per year? Okay, and this is, I put pictures of my own kids. This is my daughter up here. So how many of your athletes you work with are in at least two? Okay, three, four, five, one. There we go, right? We've seen that change. Um, you know, recently the U.S. women's soccer team that won the, the uh, World Cup, they, um, I was reading an article about them. Several of them played multiple sports. Abby Wambach, I think they said, had an ability to play college basketball and soccer she wanted to. One of the other, I believe she was a midfielder, I can't remember the name right offhand, was in like five different sports coming up. She says she would have played football if they were letter. Um, and so we see that. So these high-level athletes participate in multiple sports. So looking at it from the research standpoint, what does the research that's out there tell us? So we know that early specialization increases musculoskeletal stress, okay? And we're subject to overuse injuries. That's, I don't think we can probably say that enough. 
The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends limiting each sport to five days a week at best. Okay, and so, but then you start to look at the hours. They want to rest at least one day a week, which if the kids are real, real, real serious about it, how easy is it to get them to rest one day a week? Tell the kid, hey, we need to rest, but then you go outside and let's say they're a softball player and they're sitting there throwing against a wall maybe, um, or they're a, a tennis athlete and they're out there hitting against the wall or doing some things that, well, let's say I'm not playing, but they're still doing it, so they're still doing those type of activities. Um, take two to three months off per year. How realistic is that, you think, in today's athletes to take two to three months off? And when I was a collegiate athlete, I took two weeks off from the end of our season until summer, and then I started training again. So even myself, I've kind of violated that. Um, but most of them out there now don't do that. They'll play a sport in the, in the spring, maybe take a week in the summer, because that's when family goes on vacation. They come back, they're right back into it. They play through the, the summer. Then they go another week off maybe at the end of the summer. Then they kick it into the fall. And before you know it, that kid's going year-round with only a couple weeks in the entire year that they've actually taken a break. Um, and an increase in weekly training time, number of reps, um, total of distance by no more than 10% each week. That's kind of a standard thing when working with any athletes. So some of the overuse injuries out there, um, stress fractures, obviously. Uh, we've got little kids that are out there that are they're running maybe or they're on a field. Um, so we see stress fractures. Uh, physio stress injuries to the humerus, ankle, arm, uh, different areas there. Um, generally, they'll resolve with rest, like a lot of injuries will. But how many athletes are going to rest? They're young. It hurts a little bit. They may start compensating, get some compensation injuries. Uh, but with that pressure they have, they may not rest as much as they should. If they have pain in the, the hip, groin, knee, elbow, it's, it's a, you know, we've got to shut them down. And they don't like that. The parents don't like that. Um, you know, I, one of my little athletes uh, had some elbow pain when he was pitching, and I shut him down and told the dad, he's not, he's not pitching anymore. For, a couple, for at least a week or two. Dad got furious. He said, then what's he here for? I said, to have fun. And I said, well, you know, if you don't like it, you're free to talk to the league, that's fine, but I'm not gonna throw him because I'm not gonna ruin a 12-year-old um, So because he had the elbow pain he had. Look at some of the early specialization. Uh, Coat 99 and Hill 93 said, it's not an essential component of elite athlete development. You look at a lot of the elite athletes out there that are pros, and I've got a list at the end of the presentation, um, but you look at your Herschel Walkers, um, you know, your Michael Jordans, those type of people, they did multiple things and they were good at it. Now, there's some of those that were blessed, but they, it's, it's not critical that they specialize early on. Um, there's a study done in Eastern Bloc countries several years ago that took athletes that um, played a particular sport, and I slipped my mind right off hand, but they took one group that specialized early and they took another group that did not and they tracked them over time. Those that specialized early peaked at about 16 to 18 years old. The ones that did not specialize early and developed over time peaked at the, like the world level, not necessarily younger, okay? So I'd rather have those athletes peak later on than be outstanding at 17, 18, but then they peter out at 19 years old. Um, and so backyard street activities, um, or the elite ones, you know, participate in a wide range of things. You know, um, you look at maybe some of the golfers, Roy McIlroy. Golf, soccer, even though we probably don't need to be doing that right now. Um, you know, did lots of things. Okay, so you look at world athletes, they're good. Backyard street activities. How many of y'all remember playing out in the street? I mean, we used to take a, a ball, a sock, wrap it up with tape, take a bat, hit it. That's what we did. Now, you take a bat out in the street, somebody's probably going to, you know, come screaming at you. Um, so they were kids, and they played like kids. They ran on, they had fun with it. It wasn't the quote-unquote job anyway at that point for them. Um, and then Baker, Coat, and Deacon... Look at triathletes, um, but granted, it's late specialization in them. They tend to peak later on. They get better as they get better with the, with the different events. I was a decathlete. You know, very few decathletes are good at the, the high school, early collegiate level. It's later on down the road uh, when they get better because they, they don't specialize quite as early in those things. Another one here, Baker, Copeland, and Frazier. Um, look at this thing called high ability studies. What do we know? It said not much. So we don't know a whole lot. I'm about early specialization, uh, about the impacts later on down the road, because you've got to start tracking people over many, many years. Um, the ILC, the Medical Commission, says they need more research. That's kind of a running theme in a lot of things. There's more research needed, more research needed uh, on this. Um, Weirsman in 2000 said early specialization occurs when children limit participation in a single sport on a year-round basis. So participating 12 months out of the year, like we've said. Parameters, early start age, 
early involvement in the sport, um, early development, early improvement focused, high intensity training, early involvement in competitive sports. I've seen three year olds out playing soccer. Have any of you ever seen that before? Three, what does it look like? It's like this. They move like this, and you know they don't care what goal they score, and they just know they scored. Um, so for them, it's fun, but they're in that competitive environment. I have no problem with it because you don't see a whole lot of crazy soccer moms at three. There are some, um, but you don't see that. But if they start early involvement in the competitive and they're doing that over and over again, it can be a big issue. Some negative physical consequences: um, rapid growth. If they if they grow very quickly, which you know kids do, you tighten this around the joints. They alter some mechanics. Um, Looking at elite gymnasts, if they are if many, many hours a day, they have lower self-reported health. Um, the little girl that I work with, I, I talk to her, we, as she's warming up, I kind of walk in, her dad's great, but I kind of get away from him and I just talk. How are things going? How's your, how's your body feeling? How do you feel today? Um, are, you, are you tired today? Are you having shoulder, elbow pain? And just kind of nonchalant, just talk about it. And that way, if I pick up on something, I can change the number of throws. Right now, we're at about 50 throws of practice, including warm up. Um, which for her has been fine. She's improved 25 feet. Um, but we want to limit that because she's only 16, and I'd like her to continue this later on in the road. Um, Baxter, Jones, and Helms, training, looking at training young athletes, looked at 453 youth athletes in soccer, gymnastics, tennis, and swimming. And you can see there, looking at tennis, one-third of those are overuse. Okay, so they get some tennis elbow going on. Then you've got soccer um, and swimming as well. It's interesting, swimming, a lot of athlete people don't think about swimming having overuse, but it's repetitive motion. On the, on the shoulder, on the knees, on different areas for them. Looking at dropout and burnout, um, we know they burn out. I won't run through all these, um, but looking at hockey, so the more um, off-ice training at a younger age, they, they burned out. Okay, so you have to give them the breaks. These are kids. They need that break. Uh, Fraser Thomas in 2008 looked at the swimmers, 25 dropouts, 25 engaged. Um, those who dropped out had initial development, early training camp involvement, earlier dry land training. They peaked earlier, but then everybody else caught up with them. Um, and then Smith in 1986 actually coined that phrase, uh, burnout. You know, it's been around for over 30 years now. So psychological, emotional, times physical withdrawal. That kid I had, he withdrew physically, he withdrew mentally. It just wasn't there, and you stopped seeing the enjoyment again. Some benefits of early specialization, yes, they acquire skills early. They do really well early on. Um, they're very proficient. They're the ones that they step into the batter's box with their baseball, softball, and nobody wants to face. They're, if they're the pitcher, you know, out there and the kids go up trembling and say, oh, my God, so-and-so is pitching today. You know, they don't, want, they don't want to be the one to face them. So they're good, but later on down the road, everybody else catches up. Potential for increased recognition. You know, the colleges are there. If you've been to some of these tournaments, there are multiple coaches there that see these athletes. So there's that push. Going back once again, said you know about the scholarships, there's that push to be seen early on, and people travel over that. And then upward mobility, varsity, elite, professional. You know, if you're dealing with high school athletes, there's always that push for that that guy or that girl to say, "I'm on varsity." Okay, whether they're ready for it or not. Multilateral development compared to early specialization. We'll look at the multilateral side of here. Um, the multilateral trained athletes, the performance improvements are continuous. They don't peak and then. Level off or fall off. They're, they're increasing uh, their performance in their activities. Um, best performances are over 18. Now, all the mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas I dealt with say, well, they're going to get better after 18. Well, they're not going to get seen by the college coach to get the scholarship before that. But the good coaches will recognize, hey, we've seen improvement over the years um, in these athletes. Um, performance consistencies within competitions. They're not, they're not doing this during competition. They're pretty level. Um, or actually they get better during the competitions. And then gradual adaptation shows a lower rate of injuries. And I think all of us can agree, the less injuries we have, the better off it's gonna be for us. Benefits of the multilateral side, um, skills cross over. So you're looking at basketball, maybe to soccer or vice versa. Um, when my daughter played both, I talked to her about it. And she said, well, you know, when I dribble the basketball, I kind of think about it as weaving through the field in soccer. So I kind of see that. So they see those things, two different sports. Um, that they have the ability to, to do some agility, decision-making coordination in. Um, rest period for muscle groups keeps their interest there, and it helps them develop overall. The NSCA, here's some recommendations for them, and for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but focus on proper exercise and spotting technique. Technique is huge. Okay, I've seen too many athletes, um, when I worked with the local high school, that they trained on, on power cleans, and they had this night where all the athletes did power cleans for maxes, 
And the coach got up and said, we spent six weeks on this. And I told him afterwards, you wasted six weeks on this because it was absolutely terrible. They were catching like this, and they were more worried about how heavy they were going versus how the correctness of, the, of their technique. And I told him, if you will back off, go light, teach them how to do it right, the strength will come. You'll see, and you'll see a lot of improvements, but they didn't buy it. Um, supervisor training, physical and emotional readiness, make sure they're there, make sure it's safe and hazard free, warm up properly. My athletes just get it and they go, and they don't warm up. Um, and then properly sized equipment. You know, how much of the equipment out there is designed for kids? Not a whole lot, okay? Begin body weight, I'm huge on this. Um, if you've been to many com this conference over the years, body weight, body weight, I know there's a talk, I believe, today on body weight. Um, I'm huge on that, then progressing into other things. Um, one to three sets, two to three days. Not necessarily doing max lifts. I know there's some folks out there that are big proponents of maxing um, a lot. Um, I think there's a place for maxing, but I don't think we need to do this quite as much um, as what we see out there. Don't force it, and lastly, keep it fun. So training them, focus on these areas. Proper technique, body weight, core strength. Once again, very big on that. Uh, muscular endurance, balance, where they are in space, and then foot speed. Teaching them to move their feet, right? And teaching them how to move correctly. So here's the, the technique. I'm going to work through these fairly quick because we're running out of time a lot faster than I thought. Um, kids have to do it correctly. Use PVC, broomsticks, dowel rods, things you've probably used, you know, that don't weigh hardly anything. And they get discouraged because, especially your male athletes, that think they've got to be big and strong and all that. Well, if we teach them to do it right, that can help. Um, progress as they get better at it, and then not necessarily doing those max lifts. Body weight, huge on this one, squats, single leg and double leg. Um, getting them down, allowing them to just squat down for not only range of motion, um, but I think it helps them um, with what they, they're going to do. A lot of our sports, you know, they're, they're running, they're jumping, and most of it's off a single leg. Uh, lunges, straight line, 45 lateral. Um, just body weight at first, then progress after that. Something as simple as a push-up. Um, we were working out the other morning at our house. One thing my son likes to get on work out, so I do it with him. But my daughter came, and she was doing these push-ups, and she was way out here, and she looked like a chicken. I'm like, that's not a push-up. And so we, we worked on some of that. Dips, planks, all that, make sure they get their good technique. Score strength, use stability balls. Um, a lot of things I've learned from physical therapy, from watching my son go through it. Ball curls over and over and over and over again. Having them arch up their hips, curl in, curl out, progress to where they can do that single leg. Um, no hands stabilizing out here, but pulling themselves in. Um, BOSU, love doing stuff with the BOSU with these athletes. Um, water pipes, how many of y'all have used these before? Made your own, that's what we did. Um, outstanding, because I like it and change the amount of water in it. Put my daughter under one the other day and just about buckled her. Um, I've seen collegiate football athletes get under some of them that I have, and they think they're big and bad until I put about you know, 20 pounds of water on their shoulders in a pipe and it starts moving and they almost fall down. So, so doing some of that to help their core strength. Sandbags, uh, water bags you can buy out there. I've got some of these from my resistance training class I teach. They hate it when I bring the water bags out because they're heavy, it moves around a lot, and it forces them to stabilize. And more instability training, whether it be on foam, sand, different surfaces that allow them to be unstable, I think helps the athlete overall. Muscular endurance-wise, um, lower weights, child size equipment, which once again, we don't find a whole lot of that. Body weight, and then the literature out there, Fagenbaum said one to two sets of 10 to 15 reps. So we don't have to do massive numbers of sets with them, right? Because remember, we're focusing on technique. And if we start to get real heavy, technique can fall apart um, if we don't teach them how to do it right. So lighter weights um, at a little bit higher reps with a little bit moderate loads there. And you can see their graph um, that shows chest press and leg extension with that. Balance and coordination, uh, once again, the core stuff. Eyes closed, this is something that um, I've experimented with some of my classes, just having them stand up, do some squats, single leg. Um, have them stand up once they've got it, used to it, doing it normal, and then have them close their eyes. Because when they lose that, now everything falls apart. And it adds a whole other dimension to it, and it doesn't cost anything other than them closing their eyes. Um, new moving patterns. Get them to do different things. Mini tramps. If you have one of those with medicine ball, have them stand on it. Um, and in foam tumbling mats. Some drills here, foot speed, agility. Um, Little normal little cone drills here. Um, one thing I focus on with my athletes when they're running, um, I was fortunate enough I ran under Clyde Hart at Baylor, um, world-renowned track coach. He used a Lay's potato chip example of when you teach your athletes to run. He, he told us year after year after year, if you put a Lay's potato chip in your hand and you run, I should be able to eat it afterwards. 
So one day all of us got Lay's potato chips, we ran with them, handed to him, and he didn't eat one of them. Um, but they should not crush the thing. So teaching them how to do things correctly, whether it be lifting, running. Um, this is one of the drills I did with the uh, soccer girls that I trained. Um, I set out different cones because I'm big on not only can we do agility, but endurance, but also thinking. And I would put a group in the middle, three or four of them, and I'd say go and I'd call out blue, for example. And they would take off straight into blue, and then I'd say another color. Well, immediately they had to start thinking about, okay, where is that? And they'd have to orient their body to change directions. And we'd do that for a little while, and then I saw the pitter-patter start to happen or about to happen. We shut that down, and I got the next group out there. Um, sometimes I didn't let them get to the cone. I'd say blue, and halfway to blue, I'd say red, and they'd have to change directions. So they didn't know when it was coming, so it kind of mimics some of the things they might be doing on the soccer field. Um, some of the topic I talked about a couple of years ago at this conference um, Dr. Mann, who I believe is here, um, this auto-regulatory progressive resistance exercise. Um, I've used it on myself when I worked with my daughter's basketball team um, at our high school. Uh, I worked with her coach, and they actually started doing this model. And I like it because it allows for adjustments throughout the workout. So it doesn't stick with the normal three sets of 10 or four sets of six or something along those lines. Um, they saw good increases in overall strength. They saw endurance increases. Um, and how the model works is we look at where they're going to be, what model you want to be in. So remember, we're dealing with real young athletes. We're not going to see a whole lot of hypertrophy, if any at all. Um, but we know we can help some strength. Um, and so using different models, you can actually allow them to progress um, at a rate within the workout that fits them. So good day, bad day, it helps them out. So here's the adjustment. So if we're on this three uh, RM protocol, you can see it's a four-set thing with two of them being to failure. And it allows them to adjust from set to set. Um, works awesome. Um, I'm one of those that if I hear something, read something, I try it on myself. It worked great. When I moved it down to those younger athletes, it worked great for them as well. So younger athletes, some, some things to take home here. Uh, limit weekly and yearly participation time. Allow them the rest periods they need. I can't stress that enough as they need to rest. Uh, modify. Look at their, where they are. If they've had injuries, allow them to heal. Um, don't let mom and daddy tell you they're ready. Let a doc tell you they're ready, a trainer tell you they're ready. Um, and then make adjustments as you go. Uh, monitor them, especially during their growth spurt, and make sure everything fits properly. Their equipment, you know, pads, because if it's not fitting right, then they change their mechanics, and then we could suffer from injuries there. And then lastly, this is something from NITCA. This is the coach's dozen from NSCA. Just some few things to remember here. They're not miniature adults. I think that's, that's key. Um, preparatory conditioning is, is unbelievably critical. They've got to be ready to go when they get there. Um, over, better to undertrain than overtrain, especially in these younger athletes, um, because they will learn where they can, where they need to go and how much they can actually push themselves. Be positive with them. I've seen way too many that are way too negative. Um, so this little girl I'm working with right now, we try to remain positive in almost everything we do. Maximize recovery time. Get connected. You know, learn different ways. Learn different people. Find help if you need. If you're not sure how to work with younger athletes or the younger athletes' parents don't know what to do, get them with somebody who can. Make long-term commitments. This is not, while it would be great to be 14 years old and then three or four years later signing a multi-million dollar contract, but this is a long-term thing. For most of our athletes, remember those stats I introduced at the front, this is a long-term process for them. And then there aren't any secrets. You know, what makes one athlete great may destroy another. What destroys one could make another one great. It's very, so there's not a whole lot of secrets there. And then never stop learning, not only for yourself, but for the athletes. And I think that's why you're here. Um, because you're trying to learn some new things as you go. And then last, this is the last little slide. Here's some of the, the, the top ten greatest two-sport athletes, and depending on what side you look at, you can see the list here, okay, of athletes who participated in more than one thing. How many of you would have a problem with your son being maybe a Herschel Walker or, a, or one of these type of folks? Or, you know, a Jim Thorpe? Or your daughter being, you know, one of these, these great athletes? Okay, so they're, those are the things they participated in as they came up. Are there lots of them out there that if we change the times, maybe they would specialize, sure. But a majority of your, your athletes that make the professional level nowadays have done multiple sports growing up, and then they finally got to the point where they said, you know what, this one's um, actually the best one. Um, and so with that, I say thank you. And I believe we've got about five minutes left. And there's my references. And